Hello, I'm Robin Vincent and welcome to this spooky... Sp no, I really... I can't do it. It's just October, man. And it's the Molten Music Monthly. So this month we stumbled across an extraordinary homage to the synthy from Erica Synths. Bafaco gets your voice into your rack and MIDI out of it. The Bastille Compass gives us directional rhythms. Dreadbox gets all colourful. Steinberg gets some USB-C interfaces. And so does M Audio, for that matter. Qubit blooms into chaotic branches of possibility. I still have no idea how to get sound out of the new and improved, simpler to use, Buchler Easel. The Amperthron is a sci-fi synth that's a little bit too fictional. Cosmetronic does complex oscillations in new dimensions. Fraptals dazzles with a cyclic thing. Softube comes up with some faders for its console one. Novation has a new launch pad or two. Railwaves upgrades the Grendel. Wavelab struggles on gamely to version 10. Squitch is the world's first squishy buttock MIDI controller. And do we really need a posh SH-101? But first, I thought I would put the, the, the coming up, the, the new stuff, the little sort of notices bit at the beginning of the video rather than at the end, just so you know where we are and, and what's happening and where we're going from this point in before jumping straight into the news. So key things that are happening this month. First of all, Surface Pro 7 has, has arrived. It's turned up, I've got it here, and I will be working on that shortly. So all those people who are anxious to know whether the Surface Pro 7 can run audio software and audio hardware and all those bits and pieces, I will be getting onto that very, very soon. I'm gonna spend all week installing software on it and poking it around a bit, but you have to give it a little bit of time because I know what you're like out there. You want all the answers. You want all the answers. You're not content with me going, oh, this works a little bit. No, 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 you want to know what exactly does it run? How many plugins? How often? And what can I do about it? And so that takes a bit of time to pull all those sorts of things together to make sure that I give a, a comprehensive appraisal of its possibilities. So you're just gonna have to hold off on your questions of, well, would it run this plugin? Would it run 10 of these plugins? Would it run my project? Would it run this project? Because, you know, it's a computer, it runs stuff. But if you want my analysis on how well it runs and what to do about getting it to run and all those sorts of things, you're just gonna have to hang on a minute. Meanwhile, the Deckard's Dream. What's happened with the Deckard's Dream, I hear you say? Well, nothing's happened to it, it's just sitting over there. And I really do need to start it. So that's also an intention for this month is I will be starting the soldering. I've talked about it enough. I've sourced the parts. I've spent six months swirling around the possibility of building this extraordinary synthesizer. Well, now I'm going to start it. Come what may. I will start it. I'll get stuck in. I will at some point. You know, probably probably not this week because I have something to do this week, but probably next week. And so I'm going to be spending my time swapping it between the Deckard's Dream uh, you know, I'll, I'll solder something over there, break it, and then I'll come to the Surface Pro 7 and install some software. Then I'll go back over there, try to fix it, and then I'll come back and install some more software. So that's going to be flipping between the Deckard's Dream and the Surface Pro 7 this month, I imagine. Other things I have to do, I'm reviewing the Korg and New Tech for Sound and Sound magazine, and so I will probably be poking up a couple of videos about that by way of, of demonstration and that kind of thing. And also I have a Bastille Instruments Compass to build, which I bought because it looks totally fascinating and could be the thing I've been waiting for to sort out the percussion side of my Eurorack. And lastly, I just want to give a shout out to the Norwich Synthesizer Group who meet up once a month, normally in Jernet's Bar in Norwich, which is a fantastic location that they've just started to use. And it's a bunch of people who bring along a little synth or a module or something that makes noise, and we get together and we just sit around drinking beer and making noises. It's a fabulous thing. So if you live in anywhere, you know, within 2000 miles of Norwich, come along. You'll find us on Facebook. Just stick in Norwich Synthesizer Group and you'll find us. Just click in there and you'll get all the information you need about how to join us. It's open to anybody, anybody at all. And you don't even have to bring a synthesizer. Just come along and listen to a bunch of old noise for super fun times. Oh, live stream, almost forgot, live stream. Yes, this Sunday, the November the 3rd, eight o'clock GMT, we're back onto normal time again. Let's have a live stream, let's get together. I've got a special beer to drink that somebody sent me, so that's, that's nice, but bring your own and we'll chat about synths and surfaces and music technology and just chat about whatever it is that's going on. Maybe make some music, 
Maybe I won't. Who knows? But in any case, come along Sunday night and we'll just, we'll just talk about stuff. Okay, that's it. Let's get on with the real news. So the Syntrex from Erica Synths is an unexpected, awesome looking homage to the old, whatever it is, synthy synthesizer that everybody loves to, to look at and talk about, but probably no one's ever really had one. But this looks the absolute business and uncommonly for Erica Synths, is not black. It's kind of that, that creamy, weird sort of medical equipment color that old synthesizers used to be. And this is not a piece of Eurorack modular, this is a desktop synthesizer with exciting things like three precision VCOs, a noise generator, looping envelope VCF, of course, modulation spring reverbs. It's got these two speakers set into the top, which is not really what you've come to expect, <laughs> but I guess gives it its own sort of charm and character. I'm not very sure. Erica Synths have included a joystick controller to give you control over modulation and different things. And then of course, set in the middle is this pin matrix. Is it a pin matrix? It's not, it's actually an LED matrix. So it looks like a pin matrix that you'd put pins in like you would in the old synthy, but this is a modulation matrix made up of LEDs. So you can just tap on it or and it will illuminate different lights. And that's what is routing what to which, which is probably a more intelligent way of doing it ultimately. And I imagine it's going to give it the opportunity to save patches. So ultimately it looks, it looks a total business. There's a BU meter flashing away in there, all the knobs and bits and pieces. It's completely analog, except for the modulation matrix, which is digitally controlled. So it's mashing together these, these two worlds of saving all of that sort of stuff and yet giving you complete analog feel, sound, character, touch, and all those other gooey things we like about a good synthesizer. At two and a half grand, it seems like quite a lot for a bit of a mono synth, but then I think this is a special case. It's a special synthesizer put together and designed and constructed in a very unique way, perhaps. I mean, you know, give it six months and Behringer will, will knock one out for 200 quid. But in the meantime, this looks like an extraordinary piece of gear. Bafaco have released two really interesting modules lately, both of which I have over here. One of which I built, the Bafaco instrument interface, and the other one I got already made, the VCMC. And I've done videos on both, which you can check out in the channel. The instrument interface essentially lets you plug your guitar or your microphone directly into your rack, and you can sing into it, you can play your guitar, and it will take that audio and stuff it through your rack. It also pulls off the envelope and a trigger and a gate. So you can use it to, to trigger other stuff or to modulate other bits and pieces or itself for that matter. I've had endless fun stuffing my voice or other people's voices through the magneto. So I finally found a use for the Strymon magneto, which has been boggling me for a very long time. But now I can stick my voice in and I can start to loop it and build up layers. It's very, very interesting. And that appeals to me a great deal. So if you've ever wanted to stick your guitar or another synth or anything else through your Eurorack that's outside of the Eurorack ecosystem, then the Bafaco instrument interface is a fabulous solution for that. The VCMC is a very, very different thing. The VCMC is a voltage controlled MIDI controller. That means it sends out MIDI. You move the sliders, it sends MIDI out of a USB output or a MIDI output and into some kind of external gear, like your door. So you can have a software instrument that you can control totally from the faders on here. But not just that, it's got CV inputs as well. So you can start pouring in modulations from envelopes, from LFOs into this and through that to your software or your hardware. And what that means in reality, at least from my point of view, is that I can take my favorite software synth or a bunch of them and fold it into my Eurorack workflow. So I can send a sequence from the Eurorack into that rather than using my door to sequence or my door to modulate and then sending that into my rack. I can use all the wonderful randomness and modulations and voltageness of the Eurorack and start pushing that into software synths and doors and easily. I mean, over MIDI, I'm not having to, to worry about DC coupled audio interfaces and trying to get CV into different places. This is CV to MIDI conversion, but done in a really hands-on, creative and satisfying way with the VCMC. I love it. Go and check out my video on it. It's superb. Well, the video is superb, obviously, but 
The module ain't bad either. <laughs> yeah. Now I don't know about you, but I'm always looking for interesting ways to trigger drums within my Eurorack. I mean, I don't have a satisfactory solution for all of that yet. Got the Vimona random rhythm, that doesn't do a bad job at all, but it, it tends to structure itself in ways which are not always as flexible or as out there as I'd like them to be. The other thing I've done is I've been bringing the RD8 Behringer drum machine into the whole situation, which is interesting and has a lot of possibilities, but I want something within my system which can generate interesting drum patterns and percussion and other bits and pieces. And I think I might have found it in the Bastel Compass. Now, of course, there are other things like marbles and other random bits and piece type generators, but this was in a really small, nice, neat package. It's not expensive. It's a kit, something that I can build. And it just gives me perhaps an alternative to what other people are using and something new to explore. And that always appeals to me. So what is it? Well, I don't really have any idea, but it has three channels of stuff coming out in different directions, compass directions, get it? So it has things like longitude in it, latitude and altitude, and each of those generates triggers in different probabilistically sort of ways. There's a bit of Euclidean in there, there's a bit of pseudo randomness, and then there's the altitude, which is based on the probability of the longitude and the latitude. You're getting all this? I'm not really explaining it well, but my understanding is that it's a cool little module that does cool stuff, and I want cool stuff in my rack because I'm cool, and that's good enough for me. And it creates triggers, a whole bunch of triggers. But, you know, I don't really know how it works yet because I haven't built it. I hope to do that this week at some point. But it's only like 100 euros for the kit. It looks very interesting because it's no longer the wooden front or even the aluminium front that Bastille have been using up to now. It uses a kind of a different black front. And I confess to liking that because I've always wanted to have some Bastille Instruments modules. It's just I've never quite found something that appeals enough. And I've always been slightly put off by the wooden front end because you know, there's aesthetics and stuff in all of this, isn't there? And it's, it's just one of those things that I'm not sure that that would fit nicely in what I've already got. So these new front panels, the, you know, that's a bing, a nice tick. That makes me think, oh yeah, and this side look a bit deeper and go, oh no, but this, this, this could be the one. So if I haven't explained any of that at all, that's okay, I'll do a whole video on it at some point soon. Now, last month when Dreadbox introduced the Antifun, Anti-fun? <laughs> that doesn't sound right. That sounds like something the opposite of fun. And that can't be right, not from Dreadbox. But anyway, in the launch video to the Antiphon, there were a whole bunch of other modules in the, in the background that were kind of being blurred out so you couldn't make out exactly what they were, but they appeared to be extremely colorful. Well, now Dreadbox have announced and released what these colorful bits and pieces are. And they look totally great, totally amazing. I mean, they, they've kind of, in some ways, have come off a bit of a production line and look a bit cookie cutter from each other. So although they have radically different functionality, they have a similar size and layout with kind of four patch sockets, four knobs and four sliders. But I don't mind that so much because the functionality looks really, really cool. And the colors, talking about aesthetics a moment ago with the compass going, oh yeah, black and silver, man, that's all I want. Well, actually, no, I, I really like color too. And there's something in the palette that they're using that I really, really like. So it's called the Chromatic Range from Dreadbox. And it includes things like a performance VCO. Why performance? I don't know. But it has a bunch of waveforms that you can morph between. Is that, is that performance related? I don't know. Or maybe it just means it works really fast. I don't know. <laughs> Another one is a multifunctional filter. Lots of functions. So the VCO is called Hysteria. They've also got a Eudemonia. See, I'm going to struggle with all these words, which is a VCA and filter, high pass and low pass. Then there's Nostalgia, which is a three stage delay, which has a built in LFO and you can even plug a guitar into it. They have a function generator called the Ataxia, which gives you kind of that rise and fall of maths in an LFO slash envelope kind of way. And there's a bit crusher noise generator filtery thingy called Dystopia. And then finally you have a mixer and attenuator called Utopia. I mean, great names, great colors. They're all under about a hundred quid. So a fabulous range of fabulous value with interesting, creative and stunning to look at features and, and, and bits and pieces. 
I think they're great. You're going to have a whole rack of this stuff and it would look phenomenal. Stonemaker have released a whole bunch of new yet old audio interfaces. These are the URC audio interfaces. They're not the UR. No, no, no. These are the URC. What does that mean? Well, it's exactly the same as the UR audio interfaces, except they have USB-C on them. So, you know, staggering amount of innovation here from Steinberg, where they try to sell us the same old stuff with a slightly different port on it. Now, I don't really mean that because the Steinberg UR range of audio interfaces are awesome, have always been awesome. I've got a 2AM over there and it's it's been a workhorse audio interface for many, many years for me. And there's nothing wrong in updating something which works to provide it better connectivity for whatever it is that's coming along now. So very simply, these are just upgraded versions of the UR22, the UR44, and the 816. And they all just have a C on the end to let you know that it's got a USB-C port on it. Other than that, as far as I'm aware, they just give you the same high performance, low latency, simple plug it in and it works kind of performance that we've come to expect from these audio interfaces. Now, M Audio have done something similar with their range of desktop audio interfaces. I've always quite liked these. I mean, they're a bit chunky, but I'm a sucker for a desktop audio interface, a nice big knob on the top. I like all of that. I mean, that's the downside of the uh, Steinberg ones is they're all in these stupid little one U things. I can't stand that. It doesn't give you room to do anything. But of course, you know, a one U size thing works in some people's workflows for which they have that set up for. But normally speaking, I like, I like a desktop one. Like, I like this, like this with a knob on the top. That's the form factor that I particularly like when it comes to audio interfaces. And so the M Audio Air range does that beautifully. They're chunky, they're metal, big knob on the top. The Air range, which I thought was going to mean that they had some kind of special I don't know, Air Studios based something or other inside. I don't know, I don't really know what the Air refers to, but they've upped the sample rate to 192 for whoever it is in the world who actually needs that. No, I can't think of anybody. But they have included these transparent crystal preamps, which I suppose probably make them awesome. You've got good LED metering on there, good sockets connectivity, and you've got a range going from a weeny one up to a really big chunky one including this really small one they call the Air Hub. And that actually doesn't have any recording inputs at all. It's just an output device. So if you need something that's got, you know, you want high quality output from your computer, but you're not interested in actually recording, then it's a great thing. It's just a little box with a knob on the top. And it also has USB connectors so you can chain in some new controllers and bits and pieces as well. It's a nice idea. But yeah, they look like decent boxes to me. So if you're in the market for a new audio interface and want the desktop rather than the one you, then Check out the M Audio Air ones. Could be something good in there. Now, Qubit are a slightly odd company in that, well, I don't mean that they're odd. I don't mean that in any unfriendly way at all because they produce some fantastic modules, but their approach to, to marketing is kind of very reserved. And what that means is that they tend to release their own videos on their own stuff, which is fine. But a lot of the time, they don't make a whole lot of sense. The reason being, I mean, this, this is a general thing that happens a lot with different manufacturers when they are talking about their own gear, is that they are so close to their gear that they absolutely and thoroughly understand it through and through. And that means that they make a ton of assumptions about the product and about our relationship to it and how we understand what it is they're talking about. Because they talk about, they talk about their products in ways that you wouldn't understand unless you understood their product in the first place, but you can't understand their product because they're not talking to you about it in a way that you could possibly understand in order to get in there to understand what it is they're talking about. Do you see what I mean? I mean, I always feel that my particular gift is, if you can call it a gift, is that when I get a product or something, is that I have the ability to car crash my way through it you know, bouncing through all the boundaries and saying, look, this bit and this bit. And in doing so, unraveling it and explaining it. And people seem to, as far as I could tell, appreciate the way that I'm able to crash my way through these things because it throws up all of the questions that people are normally asking. And they're exactly the sort of questions that manufacturers tend to forget about because they already understand it all, if that makes sense. So, this brings me to Bloom, which is a fractal sequencer. What the heck does that mean? 
we don't have any idea. All we know is that it's some kind of tree and it has branches and things coming off it. They use you know, really interesting words. It can't, oh, wow, that's fascinating. What does that mean? I don't know. I mean, I've watched videos on it and I, I still don't really know. But Qubit seem to rarely farm them out to the usual people for, for videos. And so we don't seem to get that insight from other users. And so when people buy their own, as, as, as they will and they can, they don't then tend to spend the time making videos on them because they're too busy making music. So Qubit, if you're out there, I would recommend, you know, just send half a dozen out to people who are going to make videos for you because I've been reading a lot about the Bloom and I see lots and lots of comments from people going, well, I don't quite get it. I don't really know what it's trying to do. And I wish there were some videos that really unpacked what this thing was all about. And I found that from your previous modules as well. I mean, all this wonderful range of stuff you've done since NAM, which are all fabulous looking and interesting and you know, deep and quirky. I spent a lot of time looking at myself and just going, well, I don't really know if that's kind of, is that what I, I don't really know because I never really, no one's really explained it. And so we have Bloom, this fractal sequencer that starts with a trunk and goes off down some sort of branch and then grows some leaves and something else comes and goes from that and then it changes and it, you know, we don't know. It would be good to know. So if anybody knows of uh, any really good videos that unpack this thing, then do let me know. So I'd like to find out more about it. Or Qubit, if you're out there, you know, send me one. I'll send it back. You don't have to give it to me. Just lend me one for a bit and I'll do a fascinating video on about how fascinating it is. That'd be awesome. Oh yes, my friend Bukla. What is that about? <laughs> I still don't get it. I mean, I get bits of it. I get wayfolding and low pass gates, I think. But the, the Bukla easel command thing, fabulous looking suitcasey sort of strange weirdo synthesizer, fantastic. But whenever I play with a software version and I've got you know, the Arturia Bookler one, and I think there's some others as well. It just, I don't, it's like, what, but with, I mean, I, I don't really know where to start or what it is that anything is actually doing. But Bookler have decided to get a little bit more with it these days, and they are, they are. There's a, there's a whole load of sort of new and interesting stuff bubbling out of Bookler USA, and that's awesome, I think. And one of those things is to take their music easel and just to calm it down a bit, put some things in that people have been asking for, try to make it a little bit simpler to use, try to reveal a few more CV inputs and give it to us without the touch plate keyboard. So it's a bit simpler, a bit more compatible and hopefully cheaper. Well, it's not really cheaper, but it's a lovely idea. And so we have now the booklet easel command or also known as the 208C. And it gives us a slightly less scary layout with, you know, the sorts of sockets and bits and pieces that you're familiar with and faders and stuff. They've even colorized it a little bit more sensibly to group things together so it gives you clues as to how things work together. But I, I, I don't know, <laughs> I, still, I still don't really even know where to start. But this thing is on Kickstarter and they've already taken 45 orders, which is enough to do over two and a half times their goal, which is nice. But at around about $3,000 a pop, it's not a casual, it's not a casual purchase. But I would say for someone who's always been fascinated by Bookler, well, a bit like myself, but has never had the money in cash to, uh, to, to give it a real go, or a bit like myself, then maybe buy this Kickstarter. That's probably your best way in. I mean, I don't have a whole lot else to say about it really, other than, wow, this is amazing. Isn't it great that Bookler are modulating and changing and developing and evolving? And hopefully that's gonna bring more of us into their little world. The Amprothron. Now this is a weird one. <laughs> this tickled me, this did. So this is a crazy space synthesizer, some kind of sci-fi extraordinary thing with touch screens and Tron-like glowy things, Star Trek interfaces. It's, it's massive, it's new, it's exciting. It's gonna re completely invent the idea of synthesis. It's, it's an evolution, it's futuristic. It's beyond anything that anyone could have possibly thought about. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, it's a bit of a synthesizer, right? And I wrote this up for Gear News and the impression that I got was that something weird was going on because they seem to have this uh, Facebook launch party scheduled that I signed up for and then the day kind of came and went and nothing was said. And then there was a little 
bleepy video about it and they seem to kind of ignore the fact that they were supposed to have launched it and then they hadn't. And I, I saw I said on Gear News that this is a bit weird. I don't know what they're, what they're doing or whether it's actually going to come out. And then we got kind of a snarky email from them saying, oh, we didn't say anything of the sort. You're just spreading lies about us. What? Because apparently what happened was that I misread the date on the launch party and the date was actually a year hence. So in 2020, so the release date wasn't the 1st of September 2019, as you would have thought when a launch party was comes up on your Facebook feed and says there's a launch party on the 1st of September and you go, oh, I'm going to go and have a look at that. And then in actuality, it's in a whole year's time. So basically what they're saying is this synthesizer doesn't exist. They have a thought of a potential synthesizer that may at some point get launched next year. And then they were telling me off for, for the spreading lies about how weird it is. Oh, I don't know. But anyway, it's kind of interesting, I suppose, but it's one of those things which you now think, well, you know, a year is actually quite a long time in terms of music technology because products turn up at NAMM, for instance, in January, and sometimes take two years to appear. Development changes, companies change, they rise, they fall, ideas disappear, all that kind of thing. So setting up some kind of launch party, we're gonna launch this in September, 2020, is, it just doesn't make any sense. But in the meantime, what do we have? We have no idea because they're not giving us any information because this thing does probably not really exist. At the moment, it's a bit of an app. It seems to be an app on an iPad, probably with some hardware built in and it's a bit of a synth. And it's of course revolutionary, it doesn't sound like anything else. It doesn't sound like a, a bazillion, bazillion other software synthesizers we've heard before. But I mean, I can only really be a bit sort of cynical about it because they haven't really given us much in the way of information and they've kind of been a bit annoying about it. <laughs> so what I can say is that, well, it kind of sounds interesting, I suppose, but all this secrecy and weirdness about launch parties a year from now is, is not really doing you any favors. I mean, show us something. The tease campaigns, I think, are, are, we're kind of getting a bit bored of all that whole thing, and we're more interested in learning about what it is that you're doing, because if it's a cool synthesizer, then it's a cool synthesizer, and we're interested in that. We're not that interested in glimpses of something, which is a long, long way off, and hints that this is the most awesome thing ever. That That's just boring, you know? <laughs> that's boring. I mean, Behringer suffering from that a bit as well, as they are at the moment with their W, WI, W-I-N thing, you know, we're kind of in some ways past caring and we'll get excited when we hear about it and it comes along because we do, because we're into synthesizers. But the, the teasing and the secrecy, oh, geez, man. It's, I just don't think it's worth it. I don't think it does anything other than generate anxiety and ultimately people go, you know, whatever. Cosmetronic. Now, I came across these people at Synthfest, and it was quite a little fine. I'd not come across them before, but they had this Dimensions, this complex oscillator, which looked really, really nice. It was kind of two oscillators together, mirrored each other with a, a knob blending, morphing thing, probably, in the middle, and had lots of wave shaping and wave folding and feeding one into the other in order to create complex sounds, which is what a complex oscillator, I suppose, is all about. But it had a great glow to it in the middle and a look. I liked the design. It was, it was simple and smart, sort of understated and yet gorgeous and inviting. Anyway, it's called Dimensions. It looks really good. They also had a couple of other things. One was a stereo mixer, I think. The other one was a function generator envelope called Delta V, which I thought that's fantastic. That is exactly one of those things that I've been after. And now it is in here. It's in here. What is it? Well, it's essentially a maths, but in a smaller form that gives you an AD envelope that loops so you can use it as an RFO or some other kind of kind of thing. And is essentially just two simple envelopes. I just want two simple envelopes because that's all I ever use the maths for. I use it as a pair of simple envelopes or one that I can modulate a bit to give you that cyclic thing going on. I know what I mean. It's perfect. It's great. It's small. It fits in. It's half the price of a maths and it does it does the job. If that's all you're after, if you're just after a, you know, a rise full envelope a couple of times, then it's a very useful little module. Fraptals have released the Asta. We saw this at Superbooth and it's an incredibly and impossibly versatile cyclic round oval-ish Eurorack sequencer. 
I love the way it goes around. I love that idea. It's just brilliant. Why on earth do we have sequences that are in a straight line? That's never really made any sense. If you think about it, it should all be cyclic because that's how these things go. So anyway, the Uster is a four channel, four track, if you like, 16 step sequencer, but where each step can store four voltages or something and has two gates and for every stage, then you can take 16 stages and make 16 patterns, which then to lock with your four channels. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of sort of button holding and twisting in order to have access to the different things per step because you don't have everything out on the table. You've got your 16 steps, sure, but you have that in a certain mode in order to dial up the notes and another certain mode to dial up the modulation and another certain mode to dial up something else. So there does seem to be a lot of button pressing involved in order to change modes and I wonder how the workflow goes in remembering exactly where you are and what you're doing. But the knobs around the outside are encoders and so they're all lit with LEDs, so whatever mode you're in, it, it is able to show you the information about the values that are present within that mode, which is a problem you get if you have regular knobs and something which says or something which is multifunctional, like the Variegate 4 Plus, for instance. That's a classic example of how you have lots of different modes that you use those sliders for, but of course, once you've moved the slider, it no longer represents what it represented before. And you can get over that using encoders with a ring of LEDs around it, because when you swap between different things, the information changes and it shows you exactly where it is, which is genius. That is the sort of thing you need if you want to keep track of what the heck is going on within some kind of complex pattern sequencer. I mean, it's big, it's chunky, it's expensive, it's not a, it's not a cheap thing, but it does have an enormous amount of potential and power and possibility for storing voltages, storing notes, storing modulation, storing gates and stuff within itself. So it could be the central music making hub of any Eurorack system. It just takes up a lot of space. Now this is quite, quite exciting for Console One users. If you're familiar with the SoftTube Console One, it's a desktop unit of knobs, which essentially operates as a channel strip. So you insert it within your door and then you get all of this direct knobby control over bits and pieces within that channel. But it always felt like it, it sort of lacked a fader or would benefit from a fader or more than one fader. So SoftTube would come up with a console one fader, which is the same idea, same form factor, but now you've got a whole bunch of motorized faders on the top so that you can control a bank of tracks within your door and then switch the console one between the different ones in order to control the bits and pieces within it. It's sort of bringing together or integrating a better overall workflow. Because the console one tends to focus directly on a single channel, this gives you perhaps a slightly bigger overview and a way to be able to move between things and then focus on individual channels. It comes with all the same console emulation that the original console one does and generally just looks pretty darn nice. Novation have snuck out a couple of upgrades to their launch pad range. It's still very much that familiar grid of eight by eight little pads, but these ones are velocity and pressure sensitive and more sensitive, responsive is the word, than ever before. They've tidied up the look, they've made all the buttons across the top and down the side the same size and shape as the performance pads in the middle and they're all there for scene launching, performance controls, transport controls, including the old Ableton Live capture MIDI time traveling recording function. The Launchpad X, which is the bigger one, has dynamic note and scale modes built in and drum and note mode so you can switch between sort of triggering and melodic playing. And the Mini Mark III just kind of does all the same sort of thing in a smaller package. I mean, these are great. They're always going to be great. And the Novation Launchpad is probably one of the most useful pieces of external hardware that any Ableton Live user could ever have. And it's good to see them updated to use USB-C and also the price is still well under control. Railways has a new version of their Grendel, the RA99 Grenadier. It's a quite unique looking little synthesizer whose sound is focused around a formant filter bank, giving it a very vocally and interestingly unique sound. And all the controls are kind of based around that. So you won't always find the same controls you find on most attractive synthesizers. These tend to focus around the shaping of sound by these filters. It's kind of very cool. Now the original one had a little four track sequencer built in and they've pulled that out 
and revealed more CV inputs to make it a more complete semi-modular synthesizer. Meanwhile, they've put the little sequencer into a box by itself and kind of expanded on its functionality to give you four notes, but four notes in interesting and exciting ways. The RA99 looks sort of interesting and, and different and engaging and is really cool because it, it just brings a slightly different flavor to your average run of desktop semi-modular synthesizers. Steinberg Wave Lab has been dragged into version 10. Oh yes, it's still alive. It's still going. It's been years, decades, decades of Wave Lab. But it's still there as one of the, the few desktop mastering pieces of software for Windows. Although, of course, it also works on Mac OS these days. But some of the new things to kind of drag it screaming into the 21st century are things like reference track AB comparisons, support for video playback, would you believe? Uh, the integration of external equipment, support for external editors and being able to route audio out of the program through something else and back in again. Which I guess is a bit like the Studio One pipeline. I mean, it's just funny to point out that it, it mentions how that wouldn't be available during batch processing. But anyway, you now have an undo redo history and you can record directly into it. Very exciting days. WaveLab just one of those bits of software. I mean, you either love it or or you hate it. It's been a bit behind the curve, I think. I mean, I think you can do mastering better these days, perhaps in something like Studio One or in Ozone, but WaveLab is still hanging in there and it does have a visual flair and it does have a way of working, which some people really enjoy and really like. So it's good to see it continuing and keeping on being developed because originally it was a piece of software developed by one bloke in a shed somewhere in Switzerland, I believe. And so updates to it were always a little bit a little bit slow and it always had its individual character and uniqueness I suppose but it's really good to see it catch up to other bits of software in a few notable ways. Squitch. Now this is either genius or ridiculous. I can't quite exactly decide which. Maybe you should decide for yourself. I don't know. It's a squidgy button. It's a squidgy button that you squidge right and you get and you squidge to play notes. So you've got an iPad app or an iPhone app. You go squidge, 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 and it plays the notes. But of course it does so in extraordinarily um, expressive and sensitive squish, squish, squish ways, I suppose. Well, at least it's being marketed as such because within it also is, is MIDI and Bluetooth and, and interesting things that you can use this squidgy, I mean, I call it a buttock. I mean, I don't know what else to call it. A dome, it's a dome that you squidge with your finger, that you, I don't know, I've got to be careful what you say really, you're squidging, right? And you can turn that stuff into MPE, MIDI information, and route that into things if you like. It's kind of like a poor man's touche controller. You know the wooden block controller thing? Well, this is a wooden, no, it's not wooden. It's a, it's a boob controller, a buttock controller. So rather than having a nice piece of wood that you're moving, you're squishing something. Squishing something, sending that out as MIDI to stuff. I mean, that could be, that could potentially be brilliant, but <laughs> I don't really know. I don't really know if that's brilliant or not. I mean, it seemed to be looking at the video, you're just going one note, one note, one note, one note. I mean, what's the, what's kind of the point of that? I don't know. But when you look at it as far as being an MPE controller and perhaps offering the sort of expression like what you get with the, the Jouet, remember the Jouet controller, the play with those strange nipply things it had on there? that gives you the way to sort of enter into modulation and move those things, things about. I mean, this could, could potentially offer a similar sort of thing. Oh, I don't know, I just thought it was fun and so I'm just putting it out there for you to have a little giggle at. The Space B SP01 has now launched on Kickstarter. We originally saw this at Superbooth, although did we really see it? Because it was so dark, so black on black that I'm not entirely sure that we did really see it. At least no one got a really good go on it, I didn't think. However, this is, of course, a new clone of the Roland SH-101. Do we need one of those? Well, maybe, I don't know. We need lots of stuff. We like lots of stuff, but it seems as though people want to have it because on Kickstarter it's already crashed through its goal only after a few days. So what is different about this one? Well, the design and the aesthetic of it is completely brilliant. It's very, very thin, gorgeous looking. It looks, you know, like well posh and designed and proper and nice and pucker 
I mean, if you compare it to the MS-101, the Behringer, which of course people are going to do, because of course you will, then it is undoubtedly superior in terms of design and beauty and aesthetic. Because the MS-101 is just a plastic synthesizer, like the original SH-101. So the Behringer one is much closer, in fact, to what the original was like, whereas this is it's an evolution, it's a futuristic rendering of some ancient technology put forward in a forward-thinking, evolutionary fashion. Oh, it's a bit flat and it's got black keys with black keys or something. But what is it about it that people are attracted to? Is it just because they hate the idea of Behringer giving you a cheap MS-101? Whereas this is a really expensive SB-01 because you can get three of the Behringers for one of these. Is it that much better? I don't know. I mean, they've got interesting new things like a dual sequencer. So it's got one sequencer for internal sounds, one sequencer for external sounds. It has a, a joystick controller for some modulation and bits and pieces. And the other kind of cool thing, I suppose, is that it has a rechargeable battery inside. Apparently it's the only analog synthesizer ever to be have a rechargeable USB battery thing inside. But it does. And so it can run for hours without having to be plugged in, which is nice. That's a nice feature. That's a cool feature, but it doesn't have the triangle wave like the MS-101 does that brought that out of the same oscillator because they're using exactly the same oscillator and it doesn't have the FM modification either. So on the one hand, you've got the big chunky plastic authentic MS-101 with FM, with the triangle, with the Roland Bender thing, or you've got the SB-1 that has less waveforms, no FM, a slightly funky sequencer, but looks Gorgeous. Tricky, in it? I don't know. I mean, you know, there's no way I'm going to spend a thousand dollars on a, on a mono synth like the SB01. It's just, it's just not attainable as far as I can see. But it's undoubtedly a beautiful device. And you know, as Kickstarter has attested, there are people out there who desire such a thing. So it looks like it's been a massive success. And that's cool. But it's been a success of 162 people, whereas the MS101 I think has sold in thousands, thousands. I imagine. Does that matter? Who knows? What does matter these days? We don't really know. We're such a, a, a wash with synthesizers. We're a wash with possibility and awesomeness and all of the things that we can get and can buy and can play with. It's just extraordinary these days. So of course there's room for the Space BSB-01, the same as there's room for the Behringer MS-101. We just want it all. Want it all. All of it. Thank you. So there we go. That'll do. I've already given you my news of what I'm doing next at the beginning. So I've got no need to run on and on and on now about any of that kind of thing. So I hope that was all interesting. Don't forget to check out the YouTube channel for all the latest videos and bits and pieces that I'm doing as I go along. And if you enjoy what I do and want to support what I do, then do consider joining us on Patreon where you can send me a couple of dollars and that's enormously helpful in funding more videos and more equipment and bits and pieces as well as giving you a bit more of a direct access to chat to me about whatever it is you want to talk about. Oh, and don't forget the live stream, eight o'clock Sunday, November the 3rd. Come and join us, it will be fantastic. I guarantee it. And in the meantime, go and make some tunes. <laughs> <laughs>